Hello, hi. Um, my name is Aaron Gilbert, Doctor of Particle Physics at Columbia. Welcome back to Marvelous Videos. I'm Rylan, and today we'll be exploring 12 horrifying monsters from every Ghostbusters movie. Backstories explored. Just the way it does not make sense to brush your teeth without using toothpaste, you cannot possibly have a Ghostbusters movie without the ghosts. After all, the ghosts on display are the true essence of the entire franchise, and it was only post the success of Ivan Reitman's 1984 supernatural comedy flick that inspired the original content to get released in a diverse array of fields, such as comic books, animated television series, video games, even to the extent of the numerous theme park attractions. But hey, that's not the point of today's video. What we're going to talk about today are the monsters from the Ghostbusters movies. That may seem amusing to you now, but we're pretty sure that they gave you nightmares when you were a kid. So, hop on this spooky ride with us, one that's filled with the horde of horrifying monsters, literally from every Ghostbusters movie, with their backstories explored. Before we go into today's analysis, we have a very small request. If you like our content, please support us by subscribing to our channel. This is a small step for you, but for us, it means a lot. Thanks. Now, on with the video. Gozer. Are you a god? No. Then... Also known by a slew of other names, like Gozer the Gozerian, Gozer the Destructor, and Gozer the Traveler, Gozer falls under the category of the most horrifying monsters that the Ghostbusters had to take care of. Gozer's history goes back to 6000 BC, when this ancient obscure deity was worshipped by both the Hittites and the Mesopotamians, but it apparently rose to prominence in Sumer about a thousand years later. It was precisely during that period when numerous cults arose and worshipped it, and in a very short duration, ended up developing their own hierarchy and their system of ritual magic. So, by the 4th millennium BC, the Gozer worshippers already comprised a very large Sumerian subculture and were engrossed in a long, protected battle with the followers of Tiamat. In due course, Gozer and its followers were not only conquered, but also exiled from the world. Eventually, Gozer became known as the Traveler, because it started visiting different worlds and defeating them. I bet you're wondering how. Well, Gozer would gain access to the New World through the coupling of two demigods, Vins Clortho, the Keymaster, and Zul, the Gatekeeper, both of whom were his minions and harbingers of destruction. Once the minions had opened the portal to a new world, Gozer would do what any menacing ancient godlike figure would do, destroy the world. By the beginning of the 20th century, powerful new cult of Gozer was active in New York City, headed by the architect and physician Ivo Shandor, along with some of the city's most powerful power brokers and business leaders. Following the end of World War I, Shandor deduced that humanity was too weak to survive, and throughout the 1920s, he, along with his cult, constructed a detailed series of supernatural mechanisms all across Manhattan, with the sole purpose of beckoning Gozer back to the world, and destroy it, of course. They would carry out a number of strange Gozerian sacraments, all taking place on top of the 550 Central Park West building that Sandor had specifically built as some sort of superconductive antenna for spiritual turbulence, or in simple words, the gateway for Gozer. Apart from this, an exceedingly powerful magic called Mandala was also created in order to power up Gozer's newly manifested body by the spirit energy. But in spite of all this, Shandor passed away before he could summon the ancient god. But mind you, his efforts did not go in vain. In 1984, the ghosts began rampaging throughout the city, and that was a sign of the Mandela actually working, and also the fact that Gozer was on his way. As a result of which, the two minions were sent ahead to choose bodies to possess. We all know how that turned out for Dana Barrett and her neighbor, Louis Tully. It was also around this time that a man named Walter Peck had switched off the containment unit, which resulted in the release of all the captured ghosts. No wonder, they started roaming around, waiting for Gozer, and while the Ghostbusters were able to make it to the building, they were a little late to stop the minions from completing their ritual and calling forth Gozer. Speaking of its personality, Gozer is genderless, although it does appear as a female in the movie, 
Next, it would not be wrong to address Gozer as an unsympathetic, merciless, godlike being, one that simply had no reservations about slaying those who it considers second class. It looks down upon mortals, is overly melodramatic, and also has this tendency to strike whenever it gets enticed. Gozer's powers and abilities include lightning blasts, pyrokinesis, shapeshifting, invisibility, dimensional travel, great agility, stamina, telepathy, intangibility, and even weather control. Let's not disregard the fact that its mere entrance had caused not only rises in paranormal activity, but also the disordering of natural forces, such as earthquakes and storm clouds. Keep a watch out for Gozer, who tops our list and is indubitably one of the most terrifying monsters from the Ghostbusters movie. Dana, can I talk to Dana? There is no Dana, only Zool. Zool, the gatekeeper. Meet this demigod and Gozer's minion, one who will literally make you think twice before you want to open that refrigerator. Back in 1984, when the character of Dana Barrett opened up her fridge, she discovered that inside was a whole new dimension, and also Gozer's temple. Of course, Dana was freaked out, and so she slammed the fridge shut before running away. But sometime later, in the midst of an intense thunderstorm, Zool managed to manifest himself in the physical plane on the rooftop of the Shandor building. No points for guessing that it possessed Dana, and that too, right before her date with Peter Venkman. Demonic claws pinned Dana down to her chair, and then, via telekinetic activity, the chair was sent to the kitchen, where Zool waited to take possession of Dana. After the possession, Zool acted somewhat like a seductive temptress, and looked for Vince Clortho, who had similarly possessed Dana's neighbor, Louis Tully. It goes without saying that when Peter arrives for his date, he did observe the thorough change in Dana's behavior. But it was curiosity that made him enter her apartment, by fooling Zool into believing that he was a friend of the Keymaster. When Peter asked for her name, she introduced herself as Zool, the gatekeeper. It's Peter. There is no Dana. There is only Zool. Well, upon further poking, Zool also disclosed that they must gear themselves up to welcome Gozer, the Destructor. When Peter refused her seducing advances and instead asked to speak to Dana, Zool eventually became frustrated enough to respond in her horrendous demonic voice, telling him that there wasn't any Dana anymore, but only Zool. The possessed Dana even went to the extent of levitating above her own bed, snarling and roaring at the same time. Please come down. Peter was ultimately left with no other option but to sedate her with a very heavy dose of Thorazine. Later, with Walter Peck shutting off the containment unit, not only were all the ghosts released, but Zool got woken up too, after sensing the supernatural energy. To witness Zool with that evil grin at the sight of such supernatural devastation was downright creepy. And later, having her take the native form of a large horned satanic terror dog with glowing red eyes only intensified things further. Better watch out for this horrifying demigod here, who was also worshipped by the Mesopotamians, Sumerians, and Hittites back in 6000 BC, along with Gozer. Bucket. The Stay Puffed Marshmallow Man Imagine a monster that was actually inspired by fictional characters like the Pillsbury Doughboy, the Michelin Man, and the Angelus Puffed Marshmallow Man. Even the thought of this combination makes one feel funny, right? Well, that is natural. Now, imagine this very monster to be the intermediate form of Gozer. Doesn't just the thought of Gozer send shivers down your spine? As per the events of the first film, the Ghostbusters were given a merciless choice by Gozer to select the form of their destructor, with the group thinking of something that could possibly never harm them. It was Ray who picked the Stay Puffed Marshmallow Man, remembering how as a child he used to roast the marshmallows on the fire at Camp Wakanda. Something I loved from my childhood. Something that could never ever possibly destroy us. Mr. Stay Puffed. Well, his accidental choice resulted in Gozer causing terror in the form of a 100-foot-tall homicidal marshmallow man, one who is absolutely bent on terminating the Ghostbusters, as well as the whole New York City, and with that, the world. The whole idea of this large, white, humanoid figure made out of conjoined marshmallows, donning a white sailor cap with a red ribbon on the very top, blue hat band, an old-school blue sailor's collar, 
and a red neckerchief crushing a church while trying to scale the 550 Central Park West building is bound to send anyone into a panic mode. Also, let's not disregard its sole purpose. It wants to destroy the world, and it just won't stop until it actually does so. Wondering how to defeat this monstrosity? Well, the only way to roast this marshmallow is for the Ghostbusters to cross the streams from their proton packs. Mind you, this ending was only decided once they were midway through filming. Many of you might be surprised to know that the character of the Stay Puft Marshmallow Man was initially regarded as a throwaway character, and its alternative was a monster that was based on Ray's pet lizard from his childhood. Also, in all the drafts but the final one, this horrifying entity was actually conjured up by Winston and not Ray. Slimer, say hello to the legendary ghost of the swanky five-star Sedgwick Hotel. While it's true that his usual territory was the 12th floor, as far as his jaunts are concerned, he was more of the non-violent type, especially one who loved eating food. That's precisely the reason why the hotel was initially able to keep a check on the supernatural activities there. But thanks to Gozer's approaching time of arrival, this floating green ball of ectoplasm was triggered into being a little more active than usual, so much so that the staff could no longer keep him a secret anymore and had to seek the help of the Ghostbusters eventually. But it's been quiet for years, up until two weeks ago. It was never ever this bad, though. Did you ever report it to anyone? Let's get one thing straight about Slimer here. He is anything but a terrifying ghost, and it goes without saying that the monster here has earned his special spot in the Ghostbusters franchise, having appeared in both the movies along with the cartoon series. All through the first film, the character of Slimer appears to have a dearth of intelligence and is mostly known for his gargantuan appetite. Having said that, this shy ghost was not all afraid to slime anyone, especially when cornered. Slimer was also featured in Ghostbusters 2, where he had on display more intelligence and could even drive a bus. And like director Ivan Reitman had always described him, Slimer is more like a party guy, one who's just on the lookout for a good time. Subway Ghost While it is not really known when exactly the Ghostbusters chance upon the Subway Ghost, it was certainly at some point after their first bust, when they had captured it and placed it in their containment unit. But thanks to Walter Peck, an inspector for the Environmental Protection Agency, barging into the headquarters of the Ghostbusters and forcibly shutting down the facility's protection grid, that caused the storage facility to explode and set free all the ghosts that the Ghostbusters had caught. Columbia Building, 57th Street. As luck would have it, Walter unknowingly unleashed the undead on New York City, and amongst the horde of monsters that were released, the subway ghost happened to be one of them. He chose to retreat to the subway, only to torment the commuters during their daily rush hour, flailing his arms with a mouthful of tentacles, howling and screeching like a banshee. You will be astounded to know that, initially, the subway ghost was destined to be a three-headed monster by Brent Boats. But for the creature to make an appearance for just a mere few seconds, the whole idea seemed a little too expensive and time-consuming. What we have as a final product is a small, non-humanoid flying creature, one that's sculpted by Steve Johnson and petrifying enough to have traumatized the subway commuters. On a mountain of skulls in the castle of pain, I sat on a throne of blood. Vigo. Born in the year 1505, the small Balkan kingdom of Carpathia, Vigo soon rose to power and prominence while ruling his home country with an iron fist and earning the infamous title, the Scourge of Carpathia. Next, upon conquering the country of Moldavia, he earned another notorious title, the Sorrow of Moldavia. If history is to be believed, Vigo was regarded not only as the most powerful sorcerer, but also a genius, despo and genocidal lunatic. His out-and-out -out evil nature made his subjects dislike him, and no wonder, he ended up slaughtering them. His list of aliases include such titles as Vigo the Torturer, Vigo the Despised, Vigo the Cruel, Vigo the Unholy, and let's not forget the one that Peter Venkman gave him too, Vigo the Butch. It should not come as a shock to you when we tell you that he ultimately died in the year 1610, but not because he was 105 years old back then, but because his people actually led a rebellion against him. So how did he die? Well, he was poisoned, shot, stabbed, hung, stretched, disemboweled, drawn to the extent of being 
quartered, and seconds before he breathed his last breath, he did say, death is but a door, time is but a window, I'll be back. Died. His last words were, death is but a door, time is but a window, I'll be back. His spirit resided in his self-portrait, one that was created way before his death, and true to his word, he did return in the modern day New York City in the year 1989. Vigo boosted his powers, drawing energy from the river of psychomagnotheric slime flowing through the desolate subway line running beneath the New York City. But despite all this, he could not regain a physical form, and no wonder his plan to re-enter the world and resume his reign of terror led him to possess Dana Barrett's baby Oscar. But thanks to the intervention of the Ghostbusters, along with some aid from the Statue of Liberty, a halt was put to his plans, in spite of having abilities such as mind control, telepathy, telekinesis, shapeshifting, and the fact that his character could even withstand attacks from proton beams. It goes without saying that Vigo was one of the most horrifying monsters in the Ghostbusters universe, one who actually stuck true to his endless mean-sounding aliases. Scaleri Brothers Amongst the Scaleri Brothers, Tony seemed to be the skinnier one, and Nunzio is the heavier one. Both the brothers were convicted murderers, who were sentenced to death by electrocution by Judge Stephen Wexler. In late 1989, it was Judge Wexler's angry tirade while sentencing Peter, Ray, and Egon that negatively charged the psychomagnotheric slime that was presented in court as evidence amongst the other exhibits. This resulted in the Scaleri brothers getting manifested from the slime as apparitions strapped to their ghostly electric chairs. Of course, Wexler recognizes them, and guess how the duo responds? Well, they crash right into the judge's bench. Next, they pick up their table and throw that at the judge's bench. Now, that's surely some way of looking for justice. So much so that Nunzio literally went to the extent of carrying off the prosecutor into the courtroom's hall. The gaping mouths, crackling electricity, and the solitary fact that the duo could actually fly made them all the more scary. We have to admit that catching a hold of these two was not an easy task at all. God knows the consistency and effort that went into finally being able to pull the brothers into a trap. Tim Lawrence, who portrays Nunzio, was also part of the visual effects team, playing a crucial role in designing the Scalaris. In fact, Lawrence was actually inspired by the Blues Brothers, and even designed the characters based on them. The Scalari Brothers were the first ghost designs to be greenlit for the movie, and were also quite horrifying ones. Ghost Train On New Year's Eve 1989, while trying to look for the river of slime underneath the old New York subway tunnels, Ray, Egon, and Winston are literally railroaded by the old New York Central City of Albany Ghost Train, with the train making an unexpected sudden appearance while the trio was on the old railway tracks. Ray and Egon did manage to quickly duck out of the way, but sadly for a shocked Winston frozen in his spot, the train went straight through his body. The after effects had Winston not even recalling the number on the train. While it vanished as quickly as it came, Egon thought he had identified the train as being the old ghost train, one that was accidentally derailed in 1920, resulting in the death of over a hundred people. It is unquestionably one of the most frightening scenes in the film, and was deliberately included to add more tension, humor, and special effects to the 1989 film. It absolutely did justice to the fact that the creators wanted to add more scares to the second half of the movie. Uh, I'm cool, dude. Yeah. Electrocuted Ghost A prison on the Upper East Side was the first penitentiary in New York to execute prisoners using the electric chair. But the first person to have been electrocuted by the chair came back as a rather malevolent spirit. In due course, the Stewart Street subway station was constructed under the site of the prison, currently defunct with issues like lights flickering. It was only after Rowan North, the main antagonist of the 2016 movie, upon discovering that the station was one of the city's lee lines, energized it with a hyper-ionization device and ionized the ghost of the executed man. 
no points for guessing that it manifested itself into the electrocuted ghost. The ghost was first encountered in the subway tunnels beneath the prison by MTA staffer Patty Tolan. The ghost appeared as a gaunt, bearded man in a prison uniform, still wearing the restraints from his electric chair, with electrical bolts sizzling all over him. And let's not forget those glowing red eyes. Of course, he terrified Patty, who fled and further contacted the Ghostbusters for assistance. While the squad returned back to the subway, they found the electrocuted ghost floating there on the tracks. We already know his dreadful appearance. Now imagine him becoming angry. That's precisely what happened when Aaron Gilbert tried to use a prototype proton pack to capture him. But thanks to a train coming along at the same moment, hitting the ghost and passing through it, trapping him in the final car. Even though the Ghostbusters had a face-to-face -face encounter with him, yet again during the fourth cataclysm created by Rowan, he joined Mayhem and the ghost of Gertrude Aldrich. We can all take a deep breath and rejoice in the fact that he was ultimately defeated. Mayhem This monster might be the secondary antagonist of the 2016 film, but do not make the mistake of taking this ghost, one who haunts the Stonebrook Theater in New York City, lightly. Unlike most of the other spirits who have made an appearance in this film, he was entirely inhuman in appearance, and bears a closer resemblance to a giant winged dragon, or let's say demon. He is green in color and has glowing red eyes. Coming back to the Ghostbusters, the team gets a call about an attack at the theater in the middle of a heavy metal rock concert when something attacks the janitor in the basement, injuring him badly in the process. Well, when they arrive, they are directed straight into the basement. It's Patty Tolan, the first one to cross paths with the mayhem, who possessed a female mannequin, used for costumes, and pursued her till she made it back to her squad. It's creepy to even think about it, and now imagine the possessed mannequin kicking the door in. Okay. We have Erin Gilbert firing at it with her proton stream, and other Ghostbusters following her lead and eventually destroying the mannequin and disclosing mayhem in the process, who roars at them and flies down the hall before going through the ceiling and into the rock concert that's happening upstairs. While initially, everybody considers Mayhem to be some sort of a special effect, until the band's effects technician screams out that he was not responsible for what was ever hovering above them. And to top it all off, Mayhem even tosses the lead singer of the band through a wall. It is only after an intense battle between the Ghostbusters and Mayhem that the latter is finally captured. That's not where this story ends. Paranormal debunker Martin Hayes stops by the headquarters later and demands proof that there's actually a ghost inside the trap. Abby Yates solely denies because of the unthinkable, which would happen if she opens the trap. But the fulsome Aaron, just to prove Heiss wrong, opens the trap, setting free mayhem, who not only hurls the terrified Heiss out the window, but also flies away. It's only during the fourth cataclysm created by Rowan North that the Ghostbusters face Mayhem again, along with Gertrude Aldrich, and the ghost of the electrocuted murderer as well, from the subway, and they end up overpowering them all. Hello, hi. Um, my name is Aaron Gilbert, Doctor of Particle Physics at Columbia. Gertrude Aldrich The eldest daughter of Sir Aldrich lived in the Aldrich mansion with her wealthy father. The day was October 25th in the year 1984, when Sir Aldrich woke up to find no breakfast. He was miffed at his servants, but eventually found each one of them butchered by Gertrude while they slept. To avoid public embarrassment, her shocked and horrified father locked her up in the basement. In fact, he kept her down there for the rest of her life, feeding her through a slot in the door. Years later, the Aldrich mansion was sold, but her spirit dwelled in the very basement. The house was eventually turned into a haunted tourist attraction. One night, while the tourist guide, Garrett, was closing up, he heard some petrifying howls coming from the cellar. He rushed to the front door, only for the doorknob to heat up and burn his hand. He tried to use a chair to break a window, but the chair was hurled right back at him, knocking him into the very wall. Frightened, he fled towards the cellar. Realizing the blunder he had made, he tried to leave, but the old stairwell crumbled under his weight and some kind of glowing bluish-green ectoplasm began seeping through the floor before the ghost of Gertrude Aldrich flew directly towards Garrett. Forget Garrett, this would make anyone soil themselves. The morning after, Ed Mulgrave Jr., after reading a book of Aaron Gilbert, 
ghosts of our past, came to see her at the university in the hopes that she could help. Aaron ended up accompanying Abby and Jillian to the Aldrich mansion. Garrett, who had survived the encounter, simply refused to go inside, giving them the keys and warning them. Gertrude soared out of the basement, fully formed, and confronted the trio. Aaron's efforts to talk to her generated no results. Then suddenly, she transformed into a hideous corpse-like monster, one with a dislocated jaw and puked ectoplasm all over the horrified Aaron, before flying out through the wall outside. Later, it was during the fourth cataclysm created by Rowan North that Gertrude, along with Mayhem and the electrocuted ghost, confront the Ghostbusters yet again, only to get defeated. Indeed, quite a relief. Also, you will be pretty staggered to know that Sir Aldrich actually took the blame of his daughter's crimes on his own shoulders, given that he himself had had such a questionable history. For instance, he sacrificed a Romanian mother and child just to save a grandfather clock from the sinking Titanic. I guess we all know what truly drove Gertrude insane. Ghost Invasion Spectres With Rowan North returning back to the Mercado Hotel, he started up his barrier-compromising master machine yet again, which also reactivated the Ghost Portal Mirror devices. Now we all know that these devices were primarily developed to attract and communicate with the paranormal. From the Mercado, the device broke open the wall between the world of the living and the world of the dead. It goes without saying that a large mass of specters were set free in the process. The Lee Lines, going through Manhattan, further opened and unconfined even more spirits to pester the hell out of the living. It was only after the Ghostbusters ended up setting off a reaction that reversed the polarity of the portal and sent back the ghosts to the place where they belonged, the world of the dead. If you enjoyed today's video, don't forget to send a like and subscribe to our channel if you haven't already. Have a good one and be safe.